We are in the book of Judges still. Uh, Broken people and a faithful God is a good title. This is part six of the Judges. So a quick review of where we've been. We talked about Othniel at the beginning of the book of Judges. In chapter two, at the end of chapter two, uh, Joshua uh, is, has led the people. And then chapter three, the judges become necessary to fight off invaders. And at the beginning of Judges, they are good. Othniel was good. Ehud was good. In as much as what we know, uh, good. Same thing with Shamgar, with not a lot. Shamgar is one of those hero legends that was passed down. Not a lot of information was passed down with it. But the presumption is, especially based on where it was located, and that God empowered him to defeat a lot of um, Philistines, that, that he was good also. We get to Deborah, Barak, and Jael, and in Judges 4 and 5, and everybody is good in that, though there was just a little hint of trouble coming through Barak. Barak seemed to be a little bit fearful or something. And and I very much, I think this whole book is structured, but it was, it was originally uh, stories that were told orally. And so you see the storytelling devices in there, surprises and turns and twists that where these stories have been have been formed um, by intentionally. They're not accidental things, but but when he gives us a hint that Barack is a little bit fearful, he's forecasting. Uh, then it later it became written down and the author is certainly trying to give us some foreshadowing of things to come. But in this case, J.L. is able to overcome the power differential and take out the Canaanite general. Um, then we go to the Gideon. As I've said many times, Gideon is kind of a hinge between the beginning part of Judges and the good Judges and the second half of Judges. And the, the, the leaders are not good. They're, they're bad. The whole book of Judges is warning us about human leadership, putting too much faith in human beings that humans are sinful. Put your faith in God, support your leaders, but recognize men are going to make mistakes and men are going to sometimes do evil things. Gideon, good at the beginning when he trusts God and obeys God, then when he kind of gets some power, it seems to go to his head and he ended up a cruel, a very cruel leader to the people, um, waging war on his own people, foreshadowing the way that kings would later do. Then we went to his son Abimelech, who was just a bad guy. Uh, Abimelech was killed in battle. A woman threw a millstone on top of his head. He was mortally wounded, committed suicide. Tola and Jair, not much given on Tola. His name means worm. Jair was a show off. He had 30 sons who rode 30 donkeys into 30 towns. And that's kind of a, a mockery, uh, someone trying to show off and kind of making a fool of themselves. Then we get to Jephthah. Jephthah, every hint about Jephthah is pretty much everything is negative. He does win a victory for Israel, but then he turns around and wages war on Israelites. Again, foreshadowing what's to come later. Uh, we're rapidly approaching the point in Judges where the Judges no longer fight against outsiders, but all the wars at the end of the book of Judges are internal. Israelite killing Israel. Basically, committing su suicide as a people if they continue on that course. So Jephthah made a foolish vow. Uh, if God would give him victory in battle, he would, he would sacrifice the first thing he saw when he got home, and that was his young daughter. And he carried through and uh, sacrificed her. And so I would say bad. Um, still, 
he did defeat an invader, so a godly purpose was fulfilled in him. And, and there is a good, we can turn this coin over and find a good lesson, and that is you don't have to be perfect for God to use you. Um, however, Jephthah himself is not good. He, he is a bad character, and all the, all the hints point to that. Then we got to Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, um, some bits and pieces. Ibzan had 30 sons and 30 daughters, and he gave them in marriage outside the clan. As we'll see today with Samson, that's a bad thing. Um, we're supposed to keep keep the, the faithful people marrying faithful people or the Israelites to marry other Israelites. Elon of Zebulon judged for 10 years. That's all we know about him. So not sure much about Elon. Don't have a lot of information. Abdon had 40 sons, 30 grandsons who rode 70 donkeys. Uh, that's a negative. And he was buried in the country of the Amalekites. So, so Abdon was not good and he was not strong. And he was buried in enemy territory, which was inside of Israel. The Amalekites had territory, and Abdon, not only could he not push out the Amalekites, he was buried in their territory. Not very good. Now we get to Samson, mighty Samson. Let's take a vote. Samson good or Samson bad? bad. John? Bad. Why you say bad? Because I got you on Gideon. Isn't that the reason? Well, he just did some bad stuff. He did just about everything was bad. Now, it's a fascinating story. Let's work through this. I don't know if we'll be able to get all the way through Samson this week, but we will make note of, we'll try to kind of inventory as we go through the good and bad things about about Samson. But um you, it won't take you long to get my opinion of Samson, I don't think. And so we start out. Now, in chapter 13, it talked a lot about his mother and father. And the classic type, uh, when I say type, that is a literary storytelling um, thing. Um, saying once upon a time to tell a kid's story, that's a type. Um, but, but... The classic type is Manoah and his wife are barren and they can't have a child. Or a child. The angel of the Lord comes to them and they're not sure if it's an angel of the Lord, which that's a little bit of a hint that they're not as tied in with God as maybe they need to be. Uh, and they tell him they're going to have a son. They, he needs to be a Nazarite. Now, this is different than a Nazarene. Nazarene is from Nazareth. A Nazarite has to do, that word means something like dedicated uh, or something like that. And it is a um, prescription for a ritual, an eight-day ritual to go through to, um, it's like a spiritual discipline to practice the Nazarite vows for eight days. Now, interestingly, they told <laughs> Samson that he would have, um, that he would be a Nazarite his whole life. And that's, that's unique to Samson. That's, that's the only case of it in the Bible. And you get right to the end of chapter 13, and it says the Spirit of God stirred or um, made to stand, jump-started um, Samson. And so it is an interesting question. Let me ask you and see what you think. Can a person who is not saved have the Holy Spirit? And that's a that's a New Testament question we're kind of projecting back on the Old Testament. I don't think, I wouldn't think so. Okay. The Holy Spirit can use people that are not. Yes. I, and I agree, I agree with both of you. Um, and it's a question I can't fully answer. But yes, Linda, the Holy Spirit, when we become born again, the Holy Spirit, 
when we become born again, the sin is wiped off our soul, and to, to use just a colloquial phrase. And then the Holy Spirit can indwell because our soul is not, our spiritual quality is not sinful. We're, our body and our habits, our mind, those that the flesh is still got sin imprints on it, sin habits. But the soul within is clean. This is what I, this is the way I read things in the Bible. And so, however, it's an interesting thing with Samson, and I want us to watch it. At times, the Holy Spirit empowers him, and it uses a unique term. It's only used for Samson here, and then later for Saul, King Saul. There's a time, um, and I believe it is before he is anointed as king, that that the Holy Spirit empowers Saul to, and he begins prophesying. Do you remember that story? And everybody marvels at him having this ecstatic prophecy. Um, and I don't think Saul was saved. Likewise, and so I don't think the Holy Spirit was indwelling Saul, but I think the Holy Spirit and this is the kind of the phenomenon that, that I'm describing that I don't I don't fully understand. So I'm trying to describe it and, and, and tell you sort of what I think. But I don't fully understand it. But there are cases in the Old Testament where the Holy Spirit uses people, but they, as best we can tell, aren't saved. And then another, the example we've talked about recently is Balaam. Balaam is a sorcerer, a witch, we would call him, a diviner, and he is called to curse to curse the Israelites by the Moabite king, and he goes out to do it, and God puts his spirit on him, and he blesses them instead, and then he makes the first messianic prophecy about Jesus, about the Messiah, the coming Messiah, uh, but he's... He's not saved. And later, the Israelites, when they go through Moab at the end of the 40 years, they they capture him and kill him for witchcraft. And so I want us to watch Samson here and, and see if we can develop an idea about what's going on. Let's start in verse 1 of chapter 14 of Judges. So God, in the previous verse, it says... The Spirit of God, the Ruach of Yahweh. Ruach is the term spirit. And that also is breath and wind in Hebrew, Ruach. The, the breath, the wind, the Spirit of God stirred Samson, got him moving. And then the next verse, verse 1 of chapter 14, Samson went down to Timnah, which is in Philistine territory. This time, the Philistines are have basically are ruling over the Israelites. And so this is stress number one in the book of Judges is the Philistines. The whole book of Judges um, is building to deal with the Philistines. And that's why, you know, if you remember, I said the purpose of the book of Judges is in order to survive the Israelites need a military general that can get everybody to fight together. Otherwise, they cannot defeat the Philistines. However, that's a bad thing for one man to have all that power. Because if he is not leading them to righteous living, to, to love God, then he's going to lead the people away from God. So it's kind of a two-edged sword here. It's a, it's a conundrum. Anyway. He went down to Philistine territory, and he saw a daughter of the Philistines. Then he came up. Now watch how he talks to his parents and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as a wife. Is that the way he talks to his parents? And it, it was customary, so I don't, I don't want to hit it too hard. It was customary for the parents to negotiate for a marriage. Um, but I see two problems here. Does anybody else see them? Um, one, the way he talks to his parents seems to be abrupt. And everywhere throughout, he never, um, 
I would go back to Genesis 34 and I would say, oh, oh Shechem, the prince of Shechem, uh, spoke more gentle to his father. He's a Canaanite than, than uh, Samson does here. Uh, the second problem is, should he be marrying a daughter of the Philistines? No, he should keep it Israelite. Let me, oh, before I go on, let me point out the name Samson is Shemesh on in Hebrew. Shemesh is the Hebrew word for son in the cognate languages, in the languages that is very similar to Hebrew of the people around. Shemesh is a deity. It's the sun god. You know, the Egyptians worshipped Ra, the sun god. Lots of people worshipped Shemesh. The Sumerians in Babylon, Shemesh was the king of the gods, I think. I may be wrong about that, but anyway, so he was named after a pagan deity. Any of the names that end in Ea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, that Ea is Yahweh. And so they're named with Yahweh in their name. And that's a Hebrew. You want to have Ea in the name. Uh, and so the first little clue, they name him after Shemesh, a pagan deity. Okay. Then he wants to marry a Philistine and he talks abruptly to his father. Verse three, but his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives, the Israelites? So let's look back. What did Moses say about marrying foreign women? Exodus 34, 12, take, take care as you go into the land, lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land to which you go, lest it become, that covenant become a snare in your midst. You shall tear down their altars and break down their pillars and cut down their asherim. The asherah pole is a fertility symbol, if you remember, in all the different pagan pantheons, there is a queen of the gods. She is a fertility goddess. And that Asherim, we've seen Ashtaroth, Asherim, it's, it's the same. Ishtar um, is all a pagan deity. Cut down these uh, pagan symbols. For you shall worship no other god. For the Lord, Yahweh, whose name is passionate is a jealous God. Um, that term jealous, we've talked about that. I mean to keep those that love me and belong to me. I don't let them go uh, easily. It goes on in verse 15. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods and you're invited to the sacrifice, you eat of his sacrifice, and what is pertinent to what we're talking about, you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. Now, is that old fashioned and outdated, and really we need to not allow people to hear verses like that, or does that still have relevance for Christians in 2024 is this a case where there is a the concept at least is outdated and 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 not needed today well let me answer then i think it is extremely important one of the big problems in christianity is that we are not having our sons and daughters marrying Christians. And it rarely, 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 it is a shot in the dark. It is a one in a million. If a Christian marries a non-Christian and they both grow in their faith, because of the nature of our sin habit for all people, if a Christian marries a non-Christian, their faith tends to go down away from Christ. It gets poor. It gets weaker. 
And so the non-Christian is not influenced towards Christ. The Christian is pulled away from practicing their religion. And so this is still a very much apropos uh, to Christian. We, you know, and I'm, I am not advocating for anybody to get a divorce, but what I'm saying is while there is still time before you get married, then daughters and sons need to be taught to take Christian spouses. And But it was very much a thing. So you see, this is in the background of what Samson is saying to his parents, this command, this warning by Moses. Now back to Judges 14, 3, or among the people that you must take a wife, are there not daughters of the Israelites that you could marry? Why do you need to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? This is Manoah talking to Samson. But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She is right in my eyes. Uh, that term right in my eyes is she's what I want. She is upright, straight. This is this is what I want in a woman. Is that the right response? Get her for me. She is right in my eyes. No. So his father and mother did not know that this. Now, this is interesting. And this is in the background of everything with Samson. Boy, I could give I could give Samson. I could give him down the road. But in the background is God working his will. Manoah and his wife did not know that it was Yahweh, that it was from Yahweh, that Samson acting like a fool, wanting to marry an Israelite, was fulfilling God's will. For he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. So Samson is a jerk. I don't know that I cannot think of a good thing to say about Samson that's in the Bible. I've told you I went, I used to go into the Bible bookstores and I would see their little poster rack and they would have heroes of the faith and the top two were Gideon and Samson. No wonder people don't want to come to a, to, to church if they know anything about sit, Gideon and Samson. They are not heroes. They are only as good as they serve God's promises like any of us. But it says in the background, God is using Samson being a jerk to agitate the Philistines. Why? Why? Why is he wanting to agitate the Philistines? Why would he want to bother the Philistines? And you know, there is no point where Samson gathers an army and fights against the Philistines. It just says the Philistines rule over the Israelites. So the, the Philistines are in charge. All Samson is is a pain in their rear end. Why? Well, it's because people of faith, and I'm putting that in quotes, the Israelites are passive. They, they serve under a pagan government. But they're like, well, you know, the Philistines, the grocery stores open, they take the trash away. So, you know, we don't, we can't talk bad about Dagon, their God, but I never really talked about Yahweh much anyway. What I'm describing is passivity. Is passivity a problem for Christians today? Do Christians ever just blend in with the culture? Live and let live? Let it roll? At that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. And so God wanted to tick off the Philistines so the Philistines would be harsh and then the people would do what when they started getting persecuted by the Philistines because of Samson? They would say, you know what? We need to fight. We need to rise up. It's fascinating, isn't it? That God would use a jerk 
Samson ain't a bit more sa saved than the chair you are sitting on. And God is using him because he's a jerk to aggravate the Philistines so they will be rude to the Israelites so the Israelites will get up off their tail and do something. It's fascinating. And I think it, I think it preaches. Deuteronomy, back to Deuteronomy. This is the words of Moses. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with the people, this is in Deuteronomy, this is different than the Exodus. When you go into the land, you shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. Exactly what he's trying to do. Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Samson does not honor God. He does not honor his parents. Verse 5. Is that God calling to tell me I'm right? Yeah. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah. Behold, a young lion came toward him roaring. And this is the phrase that I wanted to, that we were talking a little bit about earlier. Verse 6. Then the spirit of Yahweh rushed upon him. All right. The spirit of God rushed upon him. Uh, that term is tislock, um, rushed upon him. And that means to make strong, effective, or powerful. When it's talking of the spirit rushing upon him, as it is here, they give the reference back to Saul, prophesying and so I don't think Samson is saved I don't think Saul was saved uh, but nevertheless the Holy Spirit came upon them and used them made them effective made them of use to God and helped them to succeed or be successful in a thing uh, in this case the Spirit of God rushed upon him so that so that the lion would not kill him because if he's dead he can't agitate the Philistines uh, then he went down and talked to the woman. She was right in Samson's eyes. After some days, he returned to take her. He turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. And he scraped it out with his hands he, and went on eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother and gave some of the honey to them. Now, what is wrong with him scraping out honey of a dead body? Well, back to the Nazarite vow. All the days that he makes himself holy, separates himself to Yahweh, he shall not go near any kind of dead body. So that was a direct violation of his Nazarite vows. Not even his father or mother or brother or sister, if they die, shall he make himself unclean by going near their dead body because his separation to God is on his own hand. The Nazarite is responsible to keep his vow, and Samson utterly disregards it. Um, he gave some to them, and they ate, but he did not tell them, which is an acknowledgment that he knew that it was wrong for him to touch the line, the, the carcass of a lion. His father went down to the woman, to make arrangements and Samson prepared a feast. The word shatah is to drink. Um, and, and so a shatahim is a drinking party. For so young men do, as soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to come and drink with him at his party. Why is it a problem? A Nazarite in number six, two and three, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or even or strong drink and shall not drink any juice of grapes or eat grapes or fresh or dried. And so he is once again disobeying his vows. Samson said to these 30 companions, let me know. Let me now put a riddle to you. If you can tell me what it is within seven days of this feast, this drinking party, and find it out, then I'll give you 30 linen garments, 30 changes of clothes, 
But if you cannot tell me what it is, then you should give me 30 linen garments, 30 changes of clothes. And they said to him, put your riddle that we may hear it. And so most likely we could find some scripture that prohibited. This is, seems to be some form of wager or gambling, but I'm not aware of a direct scripture on that one. And he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. Out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days, they could not solve the riddle. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? So they threaten her. And Samson's wife, his betrothed wife, wept over him and said, you only hate me. You do not love me. You put a riddle to my people and you've not told me what it is. He said to her, behold, I've not told my father nor my mother. And shall I tell you? She wept before him seven days. Uh, the seven days their feast lasted. That was some drinking party. On the seventh day, he told her because she pressed him hard. So a weakness of character here. Then then she told the riddle to her people. And the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you've not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. So he calls his wife a heifer. And then the spirit of Yahweh rushed upon him again, empowered him uh, so he went down to Ashkelon, another Philistine city, and struck down 30 men of the town. So he killed them, um, premeditated murder, and took their spoil and gave the garments to those that had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went back to his father's house. So he left his wife. And Samson's wife was given to his companion, the best man, who had been his best man. All right. And so I don't even, I hardly know where to begin with, with Samson. Uh, this might be a good place to stop here. Um, there's a lot of problems and, and the author's not mixing words here. Uh, but what is fascinating about it again is that Samson is fulfilling a purpose of God. God is working behind the scenes in this awful story and with a rather awful person. Um, and so on the positive side of things, a, a very oblique, almost an inverted spiritual lesson here is that Again, you don't have to be perfect in order for God to use you. Samson could have done a lot to be a better leader for the people, um, but God can use almost anybody. And there's, no, there's nobody that is in such bad shape that God cannot use them, especially if they will turn their heart to God. Are there any questions or comments? Anybody want to defend Samson any? Okay, we'll pick up next week in chapter 15. Um, we're leaving here. Uh, Samson's wife uh, has been given to another man. Samson's not even aware of it. Uh, he is so disengaged uh, that, that he doesn't even know this has happened. So we'll stop there and pick up there next week.